Good afternoon, and welcome to our latest episode of Capital Markets Cocktails. I'm your host, Tyler Durr, a senior manager at Lambert. And today we welcome another great guest, along with a very interesting and rapidly emerging topic to discuss. I'm joined again by my co-host, Jeff Trika, senior director here at Lambert. And I'm incredibly excited <laughs> to introduce this episode's guest, Heather Keogh, a senior ESG consultant at Leaders Arena. Heather, thanks so much for joining us today. Hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so maybe it'd be best if we started off with you telling us a little bit about yourself and Leaders Arena. Sure. Yeah. Again, thank you for having me. This is um, an ever exciting topic uh, in the market. So good, good time to talk about it. Um, I guess I'm what you would call an ESG old timer. Um, I've been focused on ESG since 2006. So I've definitely seen the, uh, the ups and downs and the goods and the bads of, of the ESG market. So I started off on the investor side of things um, with a large global investment manager running their ESG um, investment um, opportunities, and I also ran the proxy voting uh, for the large firm as well. Um, and so that brought me to Leaders Arena in 2017 after having worked with hundreds of companies in that capacity at, at the investor. Um, so Leaders Arena is focused solely on ESG, and we focus on uh, companies and helping them start their programs, continue their programs where they are, wherever they are with ESG and their communication of that to investors. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's great to have you here. Um, so I think the, the other topic we kind of assigned for you was picking out the cocktail for the day. And I, I know you and your team pick something out. So maybe you can introduce that to us and Jeff can kind of, as he always does, walk us through the steps on how to make it. Sure. So um, the cocktail we chose, so I um, am not a drinker as well. I've seen your past guests have said something similar. However, <laughs> our colleague in Hawaii um, was very excited to um, introduce his cocktail of Mai Tai. I think that's how you say it. Um, yeah. So I will hand it to I have a sort of uh, non-alcoholic version over here, but Jeff, do you want to? Walk through I, the ingredients. I, I, very ESG am, appropriate of you. Exactly. Heather. You got to be responsible too, right? Yes, I am probably. Um, I, I am not socially responsible when it comes to drinking. <laughs> I suppose, but um, <laughs> okay. I, I have. I have, and we'll get into this in a bit. But I have become a lot more of a fan of ESG when it comes to investing. So. Um, you gave us a challenging cocktail, um, not just in the terms of the ingredients, which I spent a good Saturday um, <laughs> going around to different alcohol stores trying to find all these things, and um, and then also some that are very hard to pronounce. So, um, but the mai tai, and there's there's so many different versions of the mai tai, and the recipe we have posted on our, our website, we have a link, and I think it was from liquor.com um, was the, where the recipe came from. Um, but Mai Tai is a, is a very famous uh, cocktail, which apparently um, is a, uh, the translation of Mai Tai means the best out of this world, apparently. So that, that, that's very exciting. There you go. Um, but it is um, the ingredients, and we'll, we'll start going through them. So we start with regular white, white rum. So we have some regular Bacardi white rum there. Um, Orange curacao, which is right there. Um, and then we have some fresh lime juice. I, I squeezed the lime, so I don't have that in my hand right now. Um, Fancy. <laughs> and then we have some of this, and it's, I think, three quarter or a half an ounce of this, this or, orgeat, um, which I'm, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I think that's right, Jeff. Um, but it, impressive, it, impressive. It was, it was impressive. I had it written on a list and I go into the liquor store and I'm at, I, do you have any of this? And, and they're, <laughs> cause I couldn't even make an attempt of pronouncing it. And so, um, you, you mix all of those ingredients, uh, in a shaker with some crushed ice and then you do a, a little shake which I've become quite famous for doing shaking cocktails on the, on this program, <laughs> doing that. And then you pour it into your, into your glass. And then at the very end, you add a little bit of dark rum, just a splash over the top. There you go. And 
Let's see how 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 well I do on the splash. <laughs> we can't. See I'm sure that you'll part. do great. Uh, well, We're trusting you on it, that did, one. it didn't come as come out as nice <laughs> as the picture, but then we garnish that with a a lime wheel and a sprig of fresh mint. There you go. And I I pre shook mine because I didn't want to steal your thunder, Jeff. So I've got mine ready to go. There you That's go. This Heather. <laughs> yes, although mine doesn't look exactly like that, but it's close enough. <laughs> but, so, so I ha I have mine all prepared, and I don't know where I'm going with this. There, there you go. All so right, that, very that's good. what mine looks like. But cheers, cheers, everyone. Cheers. <gasps> that that is. Thanks, the Jeff. Do you wanna? <laughs> that's that. It's not bad. <laughs> okay. I think if you continue to drink that, you're you're going to have even more trouble pronouncing words. So, well, I, maybe just know, a sipper for now, Jeff. Well, I, I, I'm trying to pace myself because this is actually an exciting <laughs> conversation today, and um, I know I wrote a blog post a, a couple of months ago on kind of rethinking ESG and some of the things that. You know, I've always been a, a very strong proponent of the of the G piece of it, governance. I think that this, that good corporate governance is essential to being a good corporate citizen and being a good investment. And um, but I was always a little bit skeptical of the E and the S. So, you know, I wasn't sure. You know, environmental. I think it's good for us to be environmentally sound. Certainly, I don't want any companies to expose themselves to liability for, you know, dumping waste or you know, polluting the environment. Um, you know, and then the social was it was really the tough one because, you know, in my and I, I've said this before in my background, you know, working at Thor Industries, you know, it was, um, you know, Wade Thompson, who was a, the co-founder of the TH in Thor, um, you know, he was always fond of saying, you know, you could do whatever you want with your own money, but our, this money belongs to the shareholders. And, you know, we can't necessarily use that on charitable purposes or, you know, sponsoring little league teams or anything like that. Um, and so that was where I've, I've had kind of the most challenge in terms of, you know, coming to grips with some of the ESG, um, you know, uh, ideas that are going around. But I do believe this is something that, um, you know, for most companies, this is really essential to be uh, good corporate citizens. And so, you know, I wonder if, Heather, if you want to, you know, kind of look at, uh, give us a, a, an overview of your perspective on this um, and how you go about, uh, you know, what you do in terms of, of of ESG for your clients. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so you've said a lot of terms in there, and I think that's one of the challenging aspects of this space is what to call it. So there's corporate citizenship, there's ESG, there's responsibility, which we mentioned mm -hmm. in the context of the drinking, um, and there's sustainability. So for us, as we kind of think of the, the big umbrella of sustainability and what does that mean to run a sustainable company, you know, you want sustainable earnings, you want sustainable sales, financials, you know, you also want to be sustainable sustainable in the way you're taking care of your stakeholders. And so obviously there's investors as your main stakeholders, um, fixed income as well as equity. But then there's the other stakeholders that you mentioned, Jeff, you know, the environment, you know, we want to make sure that if we're sourcing water, for example, or, or we're using energy, that those costs are are managed properly. So it's not, yes, it's also, we don't want to dump and, you know, make waste, but you also want to be resourceful with what you're using. And then the social side, we've really seen, um, you know, it evolve and even before the last few months where we really saw employees first, you know, companies said, look, we got to keep our employees safe. That's us, right? You can't have a company if you don't have employees. <laughs> and so um, to us, it's about building value. It's not, you know, community donations are nice, you know, in some ways those can help build uh, relationships with your communities. They can help, um, you know, again, build value over time. Um, then there's the G of the governance, where there's traditional governance, everyone knows and love of a board structure, um, et cetera, and everything in the proxy. And then there's the G, where there's the governance of the in the S, policy writing, et cetera. So at the end of the day, it's still all about building value, long-term sustainable value. It, it's interesting. You bring up a few uh, different concepts. And one of the things that, you know, I... I I think has really helped me to understand the the S piece of this in terms of kind of the people and your stakeholders. And 
Um, you know, you mentioned employees. Obviously, that's a critical one. No matter who, you know, what's your size, your company is, you need to have a great, you know, a great relationship with your employees. You need to be focused on their well-being, making sure they have not just, you know, that they're adequately compensated and they have, you know, adequate benefit programs, but also that, you know, they have the, you know, the 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 drive and the and the ability to take advantage of their own talents and and be able to develop themselves uh, into better leaders, into better employees, and and you know having those sorts of resources available, I think is incredibly important. But also looking at it from you know the flip side of that, you know relationships with customers, relationships exactly. with suppliers. How are you working together to make sure that the relationships you have are strong and getting stronger and beneficial? To everybody around, um, so it's you know, it, you know, if it, 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 you know, I think a lot of con, you know, companies might think, well, you know, I, I think of my my customers, and you know, I want to put them first and make sure they have everything they need. But you know, you can't satisfy your customers if you don't have a supply base that gives you the the raw materials needed to provide the product or service that you're providing to your customers. So all of these groups seem to be really intertwined in terms of the importance of of maintaining a sustainable business for the long term. Yeah, exactly. I mean, suppliers is key. You know, if your suppliers aren't pulling from a sustainable, you know, supply chain, then they can't go on supplying you at at prices. I think we've seen examples of a lot of shortages lately, Um, uh, you know, and, and exactly your customers, you know, you have to be in touch with that. You have to measure that. You have to know what they're going to want in in 10 years and you have to start planning for that now. So again, a lot of this is, is business as usual. It just has the ESG label that maybe people haven't necessarily associated with that in the past. So, yeah, absolutely. And so I think we've mentioned a lot of elements here covering ESG. And I think so capturing all of these adequately might, you know, in and of itself be a challenge. But I'm kind of curious to know what some of the other challenges are that you see on a daily basis with your clients and expanding or, or fully rolling out an ESG program um, and doing so across a wider spectrum of public companies. I know specifically here at Lambert, we work with smaller micro mid cap companies that may have less resources than a larger cap company that can, you know, dedicate full departments and employees to these efforts. Um, so I'd be curious you know, your thoughts on what those challenges are and how you help smaller companies overcome them. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, resources is probably the number one or number two issue is, you know, how do you do this right with, you know, you barely have time for your day job, uh, let alone ESG, which which can be sort of an extra added on top of that. So resources and where to start. I think those are kind of the two big aspects for, for small cap companies, especially when, you know, you can look at your large cap peers and, you know, they have hordes of people, they have, you know, 150 page sustainability reports, and that's just not possible in the small cap space. Mm-hmm. So for us, you know, having a partner that can help you with that is certainly one way one way to approach that. You know, someone that's an expert in the ESG space that knows kind of where the direction is. Um, you really have to figure out what's important for you. So it has to be meaningful. Um, so at the end of the day, if you put something sort of haphazardly in place, investors will know that and they'll see right through that. So, um, you know, a good place to start is to, you know, find people internally that sort of touch the, the different ESG pillars and figure out what are we doing already? What are we doing already? And how do we communicate that? Um I'm not going to lie. It's not, you know, <laughs> it's not going to take an hour of your time once a month, yeah. you know, especially at the beginning. But when you put up, put a, you know, put forward the upfront work that it gets easier over time. Well, you, you bring up an interesting thought process. And this is one of the things that I explored a little bit in my blog post was that, you know, this is something that has to be a commitment, um, you know, and, and it has to be a commitment you know, from the top throughout the entire organization. So yeah. it can't just be something that we're going to go check a box and and now we're ESG compliant or now we're, you know, it's not something that's that basic. It's something that really has to be, you know, engendered within the entire, you know, corporate culture um, to be committed to these things. And and those things, I think, are, are going to be reflected in, 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 in investors' perception of how seriously you're taking it. Um, yeah. And that genuineness is really important. 
Yep, totally agree. I mean, you said from the top, I mean, the board, you know, shareholders, investors are very focused on what's the board role in this. And, you know, that could be a whole nother podcast is debating what the board role is and, you know, how in depth they get on that. But, you know, if you don't have the board support, if you don't have CEO support, then it's very hard. But again, because these are business factors and you're determining what's most meaningful from a business perspective, there really shouldn't be a lot of disconnect. There should be synergies um, and ways to, you know, connect with the, the planning you're already doing in your business. That's, that's great. Um, and, you know, one of the things and I've read, I've read a few articles lately, and there was one that was a, an interesting critique of some of the ESG things that are going on. But w- one of the points they raised, and I wonder if you can talk to this a bit, and that is sort of this, the idea of how do we measure this? Um, because I, I think you're, <laughs> There's got to be like a, a hundred or even more different, you know, indexes and, and methodologies. And how, so how, how should companies think about that? How can we measure our progress and how do we report that to, to investors and to, the, to our stakeholders? Yeah, that's a great question. I would definitely put that up there with the challenges that we hear is, you know, how to manage that and how to, how to get through that. Um, you know, I mean, there's never going to be a one size fits all, really. So, um, you know, investors all are looking for something different. The ESG rating agencies, so of which there's probably four largest ones, four to five, um, who are all going to look at this a little bit differently. Then there's the various frameworks to focus on, which adds another another element. So, but again, going back to what's most meaningful. So if you're putting a program in place that's meaningful, you're coming up with metrics and KPIs, just like you measure other aspects of your business. You know, you can measure customer satisfaction, for example example, employee satisfaction, um, you know, community engagement and how well you're engaging with them and maybe increasing sales over time because, you know, you're engaging with their community. So the KPIs should definitely be meaningful, but they're very important to measure progress, setting goals and targets over time. But again, it doesn't all have to be in day one. Um, once you kind of set your groundwork, you know what you're doing internally, set the firm foundation, and then you can you can move to the KPIs. Um, you know, there's definitely a fine balance um, between managing to these ESG rating agencies. It's definitely a pain point for sure. Um, there's going to be some aspects you're just going to be rated low. It is what it is. Um, but there's some aspects that you can improve on. And, you know, there can be ways that these rating agencies um, can sort of trigger things to look at as well. Yeah, I think I think that's super helpful, and I appreciate the context there. Um, so my next question kind of pulls in that last question, and actually something from our last episode um, surrounding the the thirteen F uh, potential proposal from the SEC, um, which me, in my opinion, in our opinion, what we discussed, kind of lead to more shareholder activism with less transparency. Um, in that same vein. Is there somewhat of an element of shareholder activism here that might inhibit companies from taking stronger ESG actions? Maybe the thought would be that they are focusing on these metrics versus metrics that the activist shareholder cares more about. Um, So is is there any element of that in play uh, that is stopping companies from uh, aggressively pursuing this? Yeah, it's a good question. It's definitely not something we've typically seen as a thing to stop ESG forward movement. We've actually seen activists in cases where ESG uh, is not happening. So that's probably even more, um, uh, you know, more common. When we say activists, there's also you know, two types of activism. There's the head fund activism, which want to take your board over. And then there's activism in the short form of shareholder proposals, filing them, voting against management. So kind of two separate issues. Um, But again, if you're setting these metrics and you're setting your program in line with your business and you're communicating that properly, you're probably not going to do anything at the expense of shareholder value anyway. Um, and, And investors definitely want to see you moving forward. And they're very open. They're very willing to engage, um, you know, to help you through this. So it's probably not much of a, of a risk to move forward than it is to not move forward on ESG. It's interesting what you said there and, and talking about this from a shareholder activism perspective. Now, I've seen a lot of companies are addressing ESG concerns and efforts specifically within their proxy statements. Yep. Is that the right place to do it or should it be somewhere else as well? Or how, how do you think 
about you know in terms of where these things are addressed within you know within the corporate you know communication side of things now i've i've known some of our clients actually have done their their first sustainability report in the last year and they've got that you know prominently displayed on their website but that it's also a piece that's an important part of their proxy statement every year yep. so how do you think about that in terms of the audiences we're we're trying to get this message out to yeah, I mean, proxies, 10Ks to some extent uh, as well are great avenues because the portfolio managers, the mainstream, as we would call them, portfolio managers may not necessarily be reading the sustainability reports yet, although they are more and more and they should be more and more. Um, and so the proxy is a great space for your key messages. You know, you can't go into t- the proxies are getting long enough as they are um, with all this, you know, added governance, which is great. Um, so it's a great avenue for summary and your key messages messages, but websites and sustainability reports are certainly the avenue to go more in depth um, on these topics. Again, when we say report, it doesn't necessarily have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be 300 pages. Um, You know, investors want good content. They want measurable content um, and they don't expect perfection on day one. So it's okay to start with a little bit of information on your website and build from there on out. Have you find, and this just, uh, you know, in your experience working in the, you know, in ESG at a, at a fund manager and, and being in charge of their proxy group, is there overlap from the buy side on, on things like this? Or, or is it still kind of treated separately, you know, between ESG concerns and proxy concerns? Yeah, ESG and proxy for sure is overlapping, and that's what we see a lot of the kind of governance uh, people that are in charge of governance are the ones that are having ENS added to their plate as well. Especially now that there's more and more votes and shareholder proposals related to ESG votes against uh, managements, uh, you know, more and more votes against boards too for lack of diversity, et cetera. Um, and so, really, where the um, connection comes is where that proxy ESG person or group, how they relate to the, the portfolio managers making investment decisions. And that's where the link is definitely getting stronger. Uh, investors are having a lot more pressure from their end clients, from asset owners uh, to integrate these factors. And so those two groups are the key ones which are working more together. So I, I think there is obviously overlap in the proxy elements and in, in including governance components along with ES to that. I think we're still hearing from from our clients and other public companies that some investors are interested in in ESG efforts, some less so. Are you kind of recommending to your clients to start including these efforts in their investment thesis, proactively interjecting into conversations with investors? Or is this something more you're preparing them for in case it were to get brought up in an investor conversation? Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> Both. <laughs> I mean, a lot of times we see the chicken and the egg, right? So we're working with our companies who are doing a lot on ESG. They say, oh, my investors aren't asking me about this. I'm going to wait until they ask. Meanwhile, we know from our research and our in-depth research on investors that they care about ESG. They just may be afraid to ask the company thinking they don't care. So we absolutely help our clients be forward thinking and, you know, bringing this up, even if it's one page at the end of your investor deck, where you discuss, again, the key factors. You don't have to go into the amount of donations and et cetera, but again, the key factors of your ESG program, leave it in there. Why not? You can bring it up, tell the investor it's there. If they want to ask you more, they will. If not, you can move on to another another topic. There are, it is becoming a lot more common, which we help our clients with as well, is ESG-specific meetings. And so those meetings tend to be with the ES and G person, as well as the portfolio manager, hopefully. And that's a lot more common. And those those can be really fruitful and, and really helpful to, you know, to help companies move forward in their programs. What, what types of things do you see them asking for when, when they're in these meetings? Or is it just more information? Or Because, you know, if I was a portfolio manager focused on these, these types of things, one of the things I would ask for is, what are you trying to accomplish? And what are the measures that I can look toward um, to see that you're making progress towards them? 
Yep. I mean, ideally, in an ideal world, <laughs> the investors want to see these are the, the ESG factors we're focused on, and this is how it's going to grow your value over time. Sometimes it's hard to make that case right off the bat. You know, sometimes it's hard to link it to cash flow, revenues, CapEx, et cetera, at the very beginning. Um, that'll get there. So that's sort of the ideal scenario. Um, but you're right. Investors want to know it's a risk mitigator too, right? Like how are you using ESG as a risk mitigation? Pandemics, you know, an obvious one going forward, hurricanes, et cetera, you know, related, could be related to climate change. Um, so they want to know, you know, what's most material for your business and how is that going to increase your holder value over time? And, you know, it also depends on industry, you know, depending on what industry you're in, there's a lot of opportunities. You could be providing solutions to climate change, for example, and maybe you see your revenues growing from, you know, sort of the green aspect of what you're offering. So that's an opportunity. Or maybe you're, you know, a REIT on the coast and, you know, or how are you mitigating flooding in your new development? So it's, it's really sector specific as well. That's interesting. Tyler, do you have anything that you want to add? No, I think I, I would just like to kind of wrap up with your, your closing thoughts on how practitioners, counselors like myself and Jeff, um, but larger, maybe internal folks in investor relations departments and companies and even investors, what, what's the best way for them to get involved in this effort? What, what's kind of the first place to start? Yeah, I mean, I think the first place to start is to designate somebody to sort of lead the charge. You need somebody internally that's not doing all the work. There's a difference between someone doing all the work, but leading the charge. Um, so someone that's, um, you know, the champion internally. So once you define that person, um, that person can then find others internally, sort of a working group, if you will, of people that can help you know, again, figure out what you're doing internally, how you want to communicate this to investors, knowing what your investors want to see, um, and really putting a roadmap in place so that you know where your plans are going forward. Perfect. I think that sums, sums it up very well. Um, well, thank you so much again, Heather. I think this kind of brings us to the close of today's episode. Uh, I'll say it's been entertaining. It's been stimulating and possibly even groundbreaking uh, for some of our <laughs> listeners today. I believe I got the E, S, and G all in there. So. Nice. I didn't catch that. Good. That's a nice, <laughs> nice time. I figured Jeff. I figured Jeff might not catch it, so that's why I had to explain it at the end. There, he, so. he has to explain a lot of things to me. It's you know because that's. I'm trying to keep my mint from falling into my cocktail and I, I <laughs> fail. Takes a lot of concentration. But, <laughs> but I do find that I like the flavor of this a lot more at the end than at the beginning, which shouldn't be surprising. <laughs> After it's out there. Good. Well, thank you so much, Heather. Yes, thank you Appreciate both very much. And, and, we'll talk and again we, soon. We will, we will have a toast to our, our another great episode and some great content and great ideas from Heather. I appreciate that. So, Here's a toast. Cheers to everyone. Yes, cheers, cheers everyone. to you as Thanks well. Thanks all for tuning in. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>